Hey everyone, welcome back to the Girl of Gen Z podcast. I'm your host, Clarissa, and today I have a guest by the name Colin McIntosh. Colin is the CEO and founder of the bedding company Sheets and Giggles. The sustainable bed sheets are actually made out of eucalyptus trees. Colin shares what a ride it has been since first starting the company and what the transition has been like going from corporate world to being his own boss. Before we go ahead with the episode, if you could kindly take two minutes to rate this podcast five stars, preferably, and leave a review on the podcast app, that would be much appreciated. And if you're watching this on YouTube, if you could give the video a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, I'll forever be grateful. As always, the timestamps of the topics we cover in the episode will be listed in the episode show notes. Without further ado, let's get on into the episode. Hi, Colin. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good, and I'm really happy to be here. I, uh, for all those listening, I missed our first appointment, so Clarissa, <laughs> Clarissa was gracious enough to reschedule with me this week, so thanks Stuff so much. happens. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's start with your upbringing. Where did you grow up? Where are you living now? Uh, I grew up in South Florida in Fort Lauderdale, uh, and I went to school in Atlanta, Georgia. First job was in Connecticut uh, at a hedge fund, and then moved to Seattle, and then moved to Denver about four years ago. And uh, so I've kind of been all over the place, but now Denver is like my home. Okay. So is that your favorite spot then? Denver uh, it is in a lot of ways. I, I'd say that Seattle is also like a very near and dear to my heart spot. Um, I miss Seattle a lot. And uh, I've got some great friends out there still, but Denver has become, you know, my, my hub, my network, my company, it's become my community. So I would say like, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I, I think that like initially I was just a little thrown off by the fact that it's landlocked, no water being from South Florida. Um, gotcha. But I, I love it now. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. That's good. So where did you attend school and what did you major in? So I went to Emory in Atlanta and I majored in, econ finance with a minor in business law um and so i got my bba from business school there and then uh i think my concentrations in business school were like in finance and business law yeah so cool cool so when you're making the transition from high school to university or college i know here we call it university mostly um because i'm in canada but what made you go to that path to major in business? It was actually a high, yeah, it was a high school uh, teacher of mine, uh, my econ teacher, a guy named Mr. Williams. I remember I just fell in love with econ. I loved, I loved how straightforward things were. I loved how um, you kind of predict outcomes and assume reasonable, rational behavior. And, you know, the world doesn't really work like that. It's not black and white. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've learned has since been tested and debunked in my own, my own life and experience. But, um, I just really fell in love with it. And so Emory was a top five business school. Uh, and I was looking to go to a business school and uh, I didn't want to go too far away from home. So my mom wouldn't have a panic attack. Uh, but I wanted to go to a really good university and Emory was top 20. I think at the time, I think it still is. B school was ranked top 10, top five. And uh, so they seemed like a really good fit. And on was kind of like my first love. And then I went into business law and finance and like marketing um, but finance, I never really caught on with finance. Like, I, I think it's really boring. It's like, all right, we get it. Like, you know, <laughs> present value and future value. Like, okay. Like it's, yeah, but you know, it was definitely, uh, a pretty easy transition for me to go from high school to college with the econ stuff, because I did have a really good econ uh, professor in high school. So, so you never felt lost when you had to choose your path. You were like, this is it. Oh no, I felt lost all the time. I, <laughs> no, like, no, I felt lost all the time. But like in a different way. So like I felt I felt lost in my career path. I didn't know what I was gonna do. I didn't know what I was gonna do with my degrees. I didn't. I figured I'd just like you know they always tell you like you just get a job like you you know. So it's kind of like a weird esoteric thing to tell someone is like you know oh yeah you'll major in this and then that will magically turn into like somebody wanting to employ you. And I thought it was really weird because like I always thought that like the stuff I was learning in college it was so like high level. I was like, how is this ever going to apply to any job? And the answer is that it doesn't. It basically, at least for undergrad, for most degrees, what they're doing in college is teaching you like a way of thinking and less about like, you know, actual transferable skill sets, um, which you learn while you're working. And so that was actually something I always felt lost in college. I was going to go to law school. I law clerk during the summers, uh, criminal defense firms. I really was passionate about criminal defense and thought about becoming a litigator um and i ended up deciding kind of last minute not to go to law school i took the lsat and everything oh, wow. and uh yeah and so i accepted an offer at a hedge fund in connecticut for my first job um which i think i got fired from in five months 
Uh, so that was a really interesting uh, period of my life where it was like, didn't know what I was going to do, decided to do something, failed miserably at it, and had to, had to rebound. May I ask why you got fired? I was terrible, terrible at my job. Um, oh, really? <laughs> uh, yeah, that easy. Was, yeah, yeah, it's that easy. Yeah, simple. So basically, it looked, um, but there, it's the largest hedge fund in the world. It's called Bridgewater Associates. It's in Connecticut, 100 and, 160 or $70 billion under management. And um, they basically hired me. So they interviewed me for one position. That position got filled while I was interviewing for it. They really liked me. They hired me for another position that I was completely unprepared for and unqualified for. It was like a, uh, a logistics and, and administrative position. And my, the way my, I, I missed an appointment with you earlier this week. The way my brain work is, brain work is not set up for, um, you know, things that are linear, like A to B to C. And so um, I, I think, I think my boss was like, after three months, he was just like, and he was like guy number seven at, at the company. Like he was like at the table. And I remember he was just like so pissed off at me all the time. Um, and so my last day there was like January 2013. And I just remember being 22 in Connecticut, didn't know anybody, fired from my first job, like totally confused to like what came next. Um, and uh, yeah, those are, I can't believe it was like seven, eight years ago now. It's hard to believe. How did you uh, take that? and turn it into something else. Obviously getting fired is not a great feeling. Were you motivated to find something else where you're like, oh my God, I'm never gonna find anything again. Like this was a huge deal. <laughs> yeah, when you're 22 and you lose your first job in five months, you think your life's over. Uh, like, you're, like, you're like, no one's ever gonna hire me again. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna get a recommendation from my current manager, like that sort of thing. But I got, I got lucky and, and a lot of times, like luck, luck to me, I think that like you have to get lucky to be successful. But luck to me is usually a combination of like working really hard and saying yes to opportunities. And so like, yes, I got lucky, but it was because I stayed in touch with the guy that hired me at Bridgewater. There was a recruiter in uh, New Haven, Connecticut that I became friends with a guy named Nate. And I texted him, you know, after I got fired, I said, Hey man, I don't know if you heard, but you know, I got let go. And he said, yeah, I did hear, heard from, from the client and, and he said, let's get, let's get a beer. And so we got, we got dinner, we talked and Nate was like, man, you're, you know, you're, you're a fast talker. Like, I know you write well, I've seen you write before. I know you're a hard worker. Like, do you want to try your hand at being a, a recruiter at my, at my company? And so I interviewed for the position. I got, I got the offer. Um, I think I was getting paid something like, I don't know, like 30 or 40 grand a year. Um, and, uh, which was a big, big decrease from, you know, what I was making when I came out of college at the what hedge fund. This, what was the salary you're making at the previous one? Um, like three times that. Oh, <laughs> and wow. like, yeah, like two, like two, three, two or three times that. And like, so it was, um, you know, it was definitely a, uh, a total change. And, uh, but at the same time, like I was really eager to prove myself. And so I became like this, my friends used to call me a recruiting vampire because like I was always up at like midnight, 1am, 2am, constantly sending new messages on LinkedIn, writing job descriptions, finding placements. And I ended up being a really good recruiter and I love recruiting. I actually wrote a post on Reddit about resumes about two and a half years ago that went super viral. It's been down, that the resume has been shared like 2 million times that post. Holy. Um, yeah, and so a lot of people know me weirdly enough as like the sheets and giggles uh, guy, but also like the resume guy. So if you Google sheets and giggles, sheets and giggles resume is like one of the top 10 things that comes up, which is really funny because it has nothing to do with sustainable betting. Right, right. Um, but in any case, uh, I ended up hiring myself at one of my clients about a year later. So there was a startup in Seattle that was looking for a biz dev associate. So I hired myself at that role, um, which was kind of a cool way to leave a company, right? Everybody got paid. And then uh, I was at that company for a while. And then I got an opportunity. Um, with uh, a company that had gotten into Techstars, um, which is, I don't know, if, but it's a, it's a global accelerator. They give you a hundred thousand uh, bucks for a small equity stake in your company. And then they put you in a room with nine other companies for three months and they tell you to go nuts, work as hard as you can. And it culminates in something called demo day where you get on stage uh, in front of about a thousand people, pitch your company, mostly investors are in the audience. And you have five minutes to kind of show all the traction that you've made in the last three months. And so, wow, it seems intense. So I did that. I did that in 2015. I was not the CEO. I was not the founder of that company. I was on the founding team. 
and I, so I didn't get the pitch that time. Um, but I did learn a lot going through that process. I worked at that company for about two and a half years. Uh, and then in September, 2017, uh, I got laid off at 1 p.m. on a Monday from that company because we basically kind of imploded, for lack of a better word. Um, and uh, three weeks later, I founded Sheets and Giggles. So that's kind of my career. It's a really weird, a really weird path. I've been fired three times, been laid off, like, and now I'm coming on three years as CEO of my own company. And I've officially worked at Sheets and Giggles longer than any other place in my career. Wow. Well, honestly for any successful entrepreneur at least the stories i've read it's never a smooth ride there's always bumps (laughs) along the way there's crazy stories and experiences to be told um but let's go back a little bit so you grew up in atlanta i grew up in south florida south florida and then you went to atlanta for school yep Mm -hmm. so did you live in atlanta then no i lived uh, this little this little place north of atlanta it's called decatur it's like 10 minutes north um okay yeah it's a little bubble so yeah Gotcha. Gotcha. And I read somewhere that you were in a fraternity. (laughs) (laughs) How was that experience? And what fraternity were you in? Uh, I was in a fraternity called Beta Theta Pi. Mm -hmm. We called ourselves Beta before that became um, a pejorative. Uh, I've got like a jersey that says like Beta on it. And I wear it to, I wear it, still wear it to the gym. And like, people are like, that's kind of weird to wear like something that says like Beta on it. I'm like, it's my fraternity. (laughs) <laughs> um but uh every time <laughs> yeah 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 but but you know it's um it was great I was like it was one of the more formative experiences um of my life like I think that living in the fraternity house with like 45 of your friends and people Holy, 45. yeah I know yeah three three stories 40 40 dudes in their late teens and early 20s like total total what's the right word can I curse on this show yeah go for yeah it. total shit fest like all the time <laughs> and it was great because like I as a 20 year old person I was basically I was put in charge of a lot of responsibility for you know whether it was like um there were certain roles I had where it was to make sure that people stayed safe certain roles I had to make sure that people were you know uh treating each other well I was on the the council you know for for the fraternity and like would would meet weekly and like set the rules and that sort of thing and so it was really great for me, I think, just from like a leadership perspective to have to like be my brother's keeper all the time. Right. Frustrating. And I had to break up a lot of fights and there were a lot of broken windows and all sorts of other crazy things. To be expected. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it was a, it was a great fraternity. It was a good fraternity. It was fun. Um, I think they actually lost their charter and just got it back a little while ago. But oh, wow. I think Greek life 10 years later, 12 years later is like completely different than when I went to school. For sure. For sure. Well, uh, obviously sororities and fraternities, Greek life just isn't as big in Canada, unfortunately, mm-hmm. but, um, I did attend Western university for a little while. I don't know if you've heard of that school. Um, yeah, I've heard of Western. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So they, they, I guess would be the bigger school for sororities and fraternities, but their houses aren't nearly like carrying as many people. I would say like eight max. Yeah. And then it's just like, it's not taken as seriously. I mean, they still take it seriously, but it's not to the extent of what you spoke about. I think the sorority houses in Atlanta, it was really funny. The sorority houses could only have like funny. It was super sexist. The sorority houses can only have like, I think a maximum of 12 girls living at a time. So there's some old Georgia law. I can't remember exactly that says that if you have more than 12 women in the same uh, house, it's considered a brothel uh, in the state of Georgia. I can't, I don't know if that law has been oh, repealed wow. or not yet. Yet. Yeah. It's really weird. Um, but that was like, so the fraternity houses were huge. The sorority houses were not. And of course, you know, there were all these weird rules, like guys couldn't stay at the sorority houses, but girls could stay at the fraternity houses. Right. I mean, it's so weird looking back on these, like, on these really, like, it was like 10 years ago, it was like very arbitrary, like rules that, um, you know, were really not fair. They weren't, I mean, we knew they weren't fair at the time. Mm-hmm. And we used to like, you know, we used to share the, the disappointment and the complaints, but like, you know, now I don't even know how some of that stuff would fly nowadays. I know in 2020, you've got to think we've come so far and like, I don't want to say everyone's sensitive, but like, I don't know. Oh, so this, much... oh, oh people are sensitive. Yeah. yeah. So much yeah. has changed that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But like, I think people are sensitive in like a pretty good way. You know, like I think that it keeps moving the needle forward and like I, the pendulum swings really fast. Like, I think that's the thing that I probably object the most to in terms of like the rapidity of, you know, one thing and then immediately there's a backswing and then there's you know, I'm, I'm a more of like a, I think a measured person. Like I, I really like people to like engage in kinder conversations with each other, but it's, you know, outrage, I think moves the needle. So. Right. 
So what made you want to start a bed sheet company? Um, well, so uh, truth be told, it was actually a really compelling business model. And so I basically, um, I, when, I, when you get laid off at 1 p.m. on a Monday, right, the first thing you do is you go get shit faced with your friends. And so we went to uh, me and my ex, ex colleagues, they, you know, we all got laid off at the same time. Oh, so no there's a bunch of you. Oh, like 16 of us. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, and we had, we were pretty successful at that point too. We had raised millions of dollars for that company. We were, you know, headquartered in downtown Denver. We were in Target, Brookstone, a bunch of amazing retailers. We were, we were in hundreds of stores across the country. Um, it was a piece of wearable technology. It was actually, um, I don't know if you looked into my background at all, but it was actually to fight sexual assault and violence. So it was a, it was a Fitbit type product that if you pressed it, it would send out an emergency alert and live location data to your friends and family. Wow. Um, so that was a very mission driven organization. I wrote the business plan for that back when I was 23, uh, joined the team full time when I was 25, 24, 25, and then got laid off when I was 27 along with everybody else. And in the meantime, you know, we'd, we'd raised millions of bucks and had gone nationwide retail. It was a really fun ride, really emotional ending. And so basically what we did was we went out to this cheap Mexican place nearby the office, a place called Benny's, amazing, amazing margaritas down in Capitol Hill in Denver. And uh, we were just drinking pitchers. And I never forget the Marlins were in town that night, my favorite baseball team. And uh, I, you know, went to the game with my friends, watched the Rockies versus Marlins. And I was, I was probably so tanked. And I was telling them, I was telling them, you know, I was emotional, it was an emotional day. I was telling them, uh, you know, about, I was like, they're like, what are you gonna do next? And I was like, I got this idea for this company, hear me out. And I was, and I like would go through the whole business model. So basically to take you through exactly where my mind was at, um, it's a massive commodities market, $12 billion and growing 10% year over year in the U S uh, it is largely traditionally physical retail. So you can help bring it online with a more direct consumer model. It's a highly fragmented space. So there's no market leader that you have to chip away at the top five companies in this space own about 27% of the overall in industry, which is a very low concentration. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it's a very flat brand space with almost zero brand differentiation or loyalty. So there's no switching costs. No one has any sort of brand loyalty to one company over another. When you're going to change your bed sheets, you don't really care where you get them from or who you get them from. You might not even know where you get them from. If you're buying them from a retailer, you might not even know the brand of your bed sheets. And so it was really exciting to me and compelling to me from like a number of different perspectives of the business model. Plus the supply chain is very low complexity in the sense that there's no Bluetooth, there's no firmware, there's no software engineers union on staff. Um, you don't have to buy tooling um, or anything else. It's a really high capital expenditure in the beginning. And so I really just love the business model. And then I realized there were no good sustainable options in the market and I'm passionate about sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so I basically came up with this whole business plan for this betting company uh, in a, like a very short three week period. Uh, and I basically, I owned a bunch of domain. I, I still own a bunch of domains and I owned sheetsgiggles.com because I thought it'd be a funny name for a bed sheets company, sheets and giggles. Right. And I really wanted to zig and be funny and, and where everybody else is zagging and being serious in like a very like boring space. And I, I remember the first person I ever told about this is my friend, Paul, and he's also an investor. He's an investor in Denver. And I, and I was having lunch with him and I said, and I, I went through the whole business model and he's like, okay, okay. And I said, and the company's called Sheets and Giggles. And I remember he was like eating and like stopped eating and looked up and he just goes, the fuck are you talking about? And that was like, and that was like the first thing that anybody ever said to me about the company. And, and, I, and he's, like, are, he's like, are you serious? And I said, yeah, I'm serious. I was like, I think, I think it's got legs. And, uh, and, you know, he knows me and he, you know, he knew what, a, that I'm a hard worker and that I, you know, I, I uh, generally have like good, good strategic thoughts. And he was like, all right, like I'll, you know, if you're taking investment, I'll, I'll, I'll invest in you. And so he wrote me one of my first $5,000 checks and wow. um, yeah, yeah. Just because you, you know, if you, if you, that's why like, if you know people like in the sense of like, not like, you know, like have like a, a an old boys network, but like, if you've like worked really worked your ass off, like you've made good connections, you have a lot of people that believe in you, trust you, um, have seen you work, have seen your output. And then you start, you know, a company, there's those people are going to be excited about it just because you're, you're the person behind it. And so I had like four or five people that I really, really cared about that I really trusted, um, invest our first $60,000. It was a small, very small friends and family round. Um, and that was kind of what got us, got us off and going.
So wow. there's a long-winded answer as to why I started the bed sheets company. Well, it's a podcast. I mean, you can talk for as long as you want. That's the point of these. It's very conversational and Good expand point. as much as you want or as yeah. little as you want, but preferably more. <laughs> so <laughs> what made you want to call it that? Like, why not put your name beside it? Why, what, like, how did you get this, like, think of this name and find the ring to it and be like, this is perfect. So I've got, I've got four rules to a good brand name. And so this, okay. So I stumbled upon this brand name because I, I was watching a movie called War Dogs with Miles Teller and Jonah Hill. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Um, I think so. Like it's, an okay movie. it's like probably 2015. I don't know, okay. 2016. Okay. It's like a, it's like a six out of 10. It's okay. <laughs> um and, but like yeah but like i love i love both those actors and like so i was that was down for the movie and i was watching it in like june 2017 a few months before i got laid off and miles teller's character is selling bed sheets out of the back of a pickup and he's trying to sell them to retirement homes and these retirement homes keep telling him like we don't need these they're too nice da, da, da. and i got so frustrated because i was like i i remember my my now ex-girlfriend was saying that she's my ex because i'm fucking neurotic like this i was like I was like, this is ridiculous. I was like, this guy bought all this inventory. He has no idea who his core customer is, hasn't done any pricing research, doesn't know his business. You know what? Pause the movie. And I wrote, and I wrote a business plan for, a be, for like a bed sheets company that night. And whenever I write a business plan for something, I always buy a domain to make it a little more real. For sure. And so my, I always gravitate towards like, what's a funny name for blank? And I was like, what's a funny name for a bed sheets company? Sheets and Giggles, that's a funny name. And so I bought it. And so then three, four months later, I had this idea in my head for a few months when I got laid off. That's kind of what sparked the conversation with my friends that night about like, I'm actually thinking I'm going to start this. But the, you know, the, in terms of like the actual brand name and the rules that I have for a good brand name, um, there's four of them. And I think that this, I just got lucky and stumbled into all four by thinking about this. Rule number one is that it has to be spellable, shareable, and memorable. So if somebody hears it once, or they see it once on your packaging, they remember it, it sticks into their head. It's great for podcasting, radio ads, billboards, direct mail, um, word of mouth. That's super crucial. So spellable, shareable, memorable. Rule number two is that it has to connote or denote what you do. So sheets and giggles kind of denotes it. We sell sheets. Uh, Casper, the mattress company, it more connotes it. He's the friendly ghost. He comes out at night. He helps you sleep better. It's like a, it's a more of a connotation of what they do versus a denotation. So that's rule number two. Rule number three is that, um, that's why like Boland Branch's name is so terrible um, in this industry. <laughs> like, it's like, no, like people, people spell, like it, it violates number one, spellable, right? People spell Boland Branch, B-O-W-L. And they're one of my competitors. It's spelled B-O-L-L. And so like, there's a, there's a They've lot I can go on. Wrong, right they, from yeah, the start with the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so then uh, point number three is that it has to have good SEO around it. So if somebody searches for Sheets and Giggles, they find me and not my competitor or, you know, some random thing, um, you know, and that's why people who pick brand names like, you know, I've seen people pick brand names like Table or like, you know, speaker like i'm like look, literally looking around my, my apartment like yeah just things. picking like, random but i but i've randoms. literally i know two companies that like pick those names I, you, you could probably look at any household object in your in your home and people have started a company with that name and it's such a stupid thing because they're never going to be on the first page of that google result for that name right. so you have to have really good seo around the name and then rule number four is preferably that you have a dot com attached to it because americans don't buy anything um from anything besides dot coms very true. Very true. So how did you come up with these points? Did you create them or this is this a little bit from school? This is, this is some, this is, no, this is just something that I came up with. Yeah. Okay. So this is yeah. all you. This is yeah. All you. I should write a, I should write a medium post or something about it. Yeah. yeah. No, that'd be great. Um, yeah. How difficult was it to find a manufacturer to create the bedding out of eucalyptus trees? Is that right? Yeah. I want yeah. to make sure I was reading that right. I was like, is he serious? Yeah. Like this? Yeah. yeah. It's like this, magic. Okay. So how, how did that come about? I feel like how did you even pitch that to manufacturers? <laughs> so, okay. So it's, so it's a, it's a material that's called lyocell. It's made from eucalyptus trees. It's been around for a couple decades. Um, and it's a, it's something that just hasn't had super widespread adoption when it comes to the industry. It's, you know, people know are familiar with bamboo, um, which is actually bamboo viscose. Um, and bamboo viscose is the first generation of what's called the cellulosic rayon process, which is making rayon or fabric from cellulose from plants gotcha. um and bamboo viscose is generally touted as eco-friendly and sustainable um it would be if it didn't have a lot of runoff associated with the process so it has very little water usage very little energy usage no insecticides no pesticides but in terms of the viscose they can't when they do the the wood pulp in wood pulp out 
um, sorry, wood in pulp out, they can't reuse the chemicals in each batch of viscose production. So a lot of times when you're talking about manufacturers, um, especially Chinese manufacturers, you're talking about a lot of runoff associated with that process in the waterways. Um, Modal is the second generation of the process. It's generally made from beech wood, spruce, or pine. And then uh, Lyle cell is the third generation of the process. And that's the most sustainable, latest and greatest uh, process. It's totally closed loop. You can reuse the same solvents over and over again in each batch with very minimal uh, waste or runoff. Um, and so it kind of solves the problem of that first generation of the process with bamboo viscose. Um, and so uh, basically the technology was already there. Uh, I, had to, I had to look for manufacturers who had the capability to do it because it's a highly scientific process. For sure. I found, I found a few people that had the capability. There's not that many of them. There's only, there's really, you know, maybe a couple dozen in the world. Um, and I was so excited about the material because it's also super premium. It's literally softer than cotton. It has a lower coefficient of friction. Uh, it is smoother. It won't pull your hair. It's better for sensitive skin. It's cooler, manages moisture better. So if you sweat, it'll evenly distribute the moisture across the sheet and evaporate it. So that way the sheets, not only do you wake up cooler and dry, but your sheets also stay fresher longer so you can wash them less often. Right. It's, a, it's a hostile environment to bacteria growth because there's no moisture. They're hypo, hypoallergenic, zero static. They're like an incredible product. And so finding the manufacturer was actually um, more of a process of like getting them to take me seriously. Um, as someone who had no background in the industry. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, basically the way you do that is you have to pitch your background. You have to say, look, I've done X, Y, and Z. I believe I can do A, B, and C in this industry. Here's why. At that point, I had already done content and collateral for the company. We had been gathering emails for a few weeks ahead of our crowdfunding campaign in May, 2018. Um, we had, I think at that point, maybe 10,000 emails that we had gathered from people who were interested in purchasing the product. And so I was confident enough to basically guarantee them a, a purchase order worth about $300,000 um, as our first purchase order for the company. And I had to wire deposit um, that um, to, to India about 10% down. Uh, and wow. that sucked. Uh, but that was, you know, uh, yeah, I was like, see ya. Uh, the money. <laughs> See you never. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and so, but you know, I didn't wire them at the deposit. I try to tell other entrepreneurs and other founders this very important like lesson: don't spend money on inventory until you are sure that you have a product the market is going to want. And so, the way that crowdfunding math is, and I don't know if you want to pivot in the crowdfunding at all and and talk about that, but um, you know, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, we did an Indiegogo. We raised two hundred eighty four thousand dollars in, in wow. forty five days. Um, you know, our goal was a hundred thousand dollars and basically the way that crowdfunding math works is very simple where if you want to make a hundred thousand dollars, you need to make 30% of that on the first day. Uh, so let's say that's just the way that, that math works. 30% first day, you will hit your goal. If you don't get that, you can still maybe hit it. But the way it works is like big spike plateau, small spike at the end. So, uh, if you want to do $30,000 on day one, and you have a $70 product, which is that's what we were pricing it in the beginning. And it was severely underpriced. We made no money on these sales. I think we actually lost money on these sales. Um, we basically uh, knew that the average person was going to buy probably 1.5 units. That was like a ballpark. So $100 average order value. And if you need $30,000 on day one and $100 average order value, you need 300 customers on day one in order to make the math work. Right. And if you want 300 customers on day one, I don't know if you have 300 friends and family, all of whom can 100% be relied upon to purchase your product at the right. same time on the same day for a crowd fund. I don't, uh, I assume most people don't. And so those customers are basically gonna come from your email list. An email list reasonably converts at about 3%, 2% if you're doing something well, or, or sorry, 2% if you're doing something poorly, 4% if you're doing something well. And so basically we knew if we needed 300 customers on day one, and it, it was going to convert to 3%, we needed 10,000 emails in order to hit our 100,000 goal for the campaign. And that became my heads down laser focused. And so by the time that we placed that purchase order with our manufacturer, after we had met them, we flew out to New York, they flew to New York, we met each other at a conference that, you know, is for home textiles. It's in March of every year in New York City. Um, it's called home, it's called Market Week. Um, it was canceled this year. Uh, you know, if we were going to, actually guarantee them this money that I knew that I had to be very confident that we were going to be successful. And so just once we had those emails and we had that engagement of people opening our emails and taking our surveys and engaging with us, I felt very confident that we were going to hit our goal in 
our list ended up converting at four and a half percent. And we did $45,000 on day one and $284,000 over the course of the campaign. Wow. So it's not infused with eucalyptus. It's made out of. It's made out of the wood. Yes. It's made correct. out of the wood. Right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. My dog Harvey is right behind <laughs> me. He's no like, tuck, he's tucked in like a tick. Yeah. Um, so how was it when you were, when you went to your first manufacturer and pitched them this idea, what did they say? Were they like, that's not happening? It was more of like, they, it was more of like they were, um, skeptical. They were just basically like, they were, you know, they, they get, they get pitched on a lot of new companies. So basically the way that the commodities market work, whether it's, you know, clothing, any, any textile, plastic, wood, anything that's like mass produced, the way that you get a manufacturer to take you seriously is you guarantee them more money than the next guy. And because they, they basically have a large assortment of machines, billions of dollars in, of equipment um, that they've purchased over the years. Um, and, you know, these, these factories are highly automated in 2020. Um, and basically they're running 24 seven. They have workers do eight, three, eight hour shifts a day um, to, you know, mostly technicians. And they basically, these machines will run all day, all night. And if they stop a machine to put on your fabric, your designs, your tech pack, and your products, they're necessarily taking somebody else off. And so the interesting thing about the Eucalyptus Lyle cell, and what I, one of the reasons I, I love it, and we have a great relationship with our manufacturers, we now have three different manufacturers, um, the way that the, the things that I love about it is that um, it's actually more expensive to produce than cotton. It's about three times as expensive to produce than cotton. And yet our prices are still lower than Brooklyn and eat that. Uh, uh-huh. And so, and so, you know, it's about three times as expensive as cotton to produce generally speaking um, because it is sustainable it's a specialty fabric, highly scientific. It's not mass produced. Um, and so uh, that ends up meaning that our manufacturer actually can make three times the cash on the same size order as a cotton bed sheets company. Um, and so, and it also means they can make more profit. There's more margin room there for them. And so with a smaller purchase order, you can actually kind of come in and make some noise. Our $300,000 initial purchase order is about a million dollar purchase order if it had been in cotton sheets. And so that type of, you know, that type of like um, initial, uh, uh, or not initial, nothing initial, but like that, that type of cloud is like kind of interesting and like unique to the situation of the fabric that we're using. Um, you know, whereas something like polyester, um, can, you know, you can make a set of sheets out of polyester for a few dollars. Um, that's all petroleum. It's all synthetic. Um, and so, yeah, don't buy microfiber for anybody listening out there. Um, so yeah, so it, in terms of more like getting to be taken seriously and, and um, I had to fight for that a little bit. And uh, I met some people that I have fallen in love with over the years. They're like some of my best friends in the world. Um, I, you know, Abhinash and, and his family over in India are like my, my, main, my main people over there. And, and I go to Mumbai um, to check in on the factories and see everybody in person and visit and get good FaceTime. And um, so I think my first trip there was in June 2018. Uh, and I cannot wait to go back when Americans are allowed to travel again. Right. For sure. For sure. I think that's important if you are able to go visit the manufacturer to see what like oh, you must. the product. Yeah. Like it yeah. just, it seems like a must do. Yeah. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. We were actually going to open up a factory in uh, the U S this year. Um, and uh, I think Alabama was the plan and um, if everything's gone so topsy turvy in the last four months. Um, but that's obviously been put on hold. So um, we might we might have a cut and sew operation in the states in the in the next uh, year or so. Okay, well that's good to hear. Congrats yeah. on that. If, whenever that does end up happening, <laughs> we we source some of our trees from Canada. So we have oh, we sweet. have yeah. So we have biodiverse farms in Canada, um, Sweden, South Africa, and India, and they're managing coordination with an NGO to protect the surrounding environments from from the farms. Um, and it's a really, really great process because we plant two new trees for every one that we harvest. Yeah, that seems um, amazing. I read that on the website. I was like, what? Yeah, yeah. It was just an investment. I mean, you need more trees to, you know, you need you need more to make more. So, sure. um, you know, it's like a great investment in the future. And um, we, we don't source any trees from any natural environments. So, like, you know, people ask all the time. They're like, are you taking eucalyptus from koalas? And we're like, no, no, no. Like, we quite the opposite. We actually donated 20% of our Black Friday, Cyber Monday sales to the World Wildlife 
foundation last year, sales, not profit. A lot of people do the profit donation, which is bullshit. They'll zero out the profit. Um, but for sales last year to koalas and ended up being, um, I think close to 20 grand, uh, wow. so for the week, for that weekend. So it was, it was a really nice donation. Yeah, for sure. So how do you market sheets and giggles or how has that evolved from when you start the company till now? Do you send product to influencers to post on Instagram? Do you go to trade <laughs> shows? Do you post on Facebook? What's your... What's your plan? You, should, you should interview my VP of marketing, Sarah. So I, so uh, the way you go from zero to one hundred thousand dollars a month in sales is fundamentally different from the way that you go from one hundred thousand to five hundred thousand dollars a month in sales, which is fundamentally different from the way that you go from five hundred thousand to a million dollars a month in sales. And so, you know, the and and so on and so forth. And so you have to continually hire new people bring on different agencies, get, get new skill sets in the door. And so I was a really good person to go from, you know, zero to a hundred. That was like my, my specialty is kind of like starting something from scratch and building a brand out of, out of thin air and being this like creative customer obsessed person who, you know, uh, is able to get on stage in front of a thousand people and like bring the house down. And I like I I don't say that I don't I'm not trying to toot my own horn I like I if I, I would go into stand up comedy if I could versus um <laughs> you know versus start my own company, but like the uh the person right now that's running the marketing is Sarah and she's she's wonderful and so um to give you like a high level answer I know I know everything she's doing and I you know we just set our budgets and goals together and strategies but basically it's a mix of performance marketing so spending on Facebook Instagram Google um, all the usual suspects in terms of digital channels. Uh, buying, uh, you know, ad time on things like podcast radio. We sponsor NPR in the state of Colorado. So Colorado Public Radio, we sponsor. Um, it's doing, uh, we have a press agency that we, re we retain. So uh, we pay uh, an agency every month and pitch us to BuzzFeed. Um, you know, we've, we've been in BuzzFeed, Forbes. We've been on today.com. We've been uh, in a ton of different outlets, uh, Real Simple, Apartment Therapy named us one of the best of 2020. Um, and like, so we, we get a lot of press. We don't pay for press. Um, and so we have an agency go out and actually pitch us. We send them samples to review and then they review us if they like us. Um, and so uh, that's a really, uh, that, those are like some of the core things. And then there's content marketing and also brand marketing. So from a content marketing perspective, we write blogs that get traction. I get my resume thing, which is like, gets tons of traffic from Reddit. Um, it's not people looking for bed sheets, but it's people who will then hear about the brand and maybe tell somebody else about the brand. Um, and then we get a lot of word of mouth, uh, repeat business. Um, and we also have a really good Amazon presence. We have 600 reviews on Amazon now. Uh, I think we're four and a half stars, 4.5 on our website. We're 4.8, uh, and on Facebook, we're 4.7. And if I can segue real quick into review score. Uh, for everybody listening, when you're buying something online, um, especially if it's my competitors in the betting space, uh, review their, or take a look at their reviews on their website, take a look at their reviews on their Facebook, and take a look at their reviews on Amazon. And if they all match up, then you should buy the product. If there is a large discrepancy, say, you know, their Facebook for one of my competitors is a 3.8, and their website boasts a 4.8, and you can't find the one star reviews on the website, it's probably because they're full of shit and hiding their one star <laughs> reviews. Filtering and so, out. yeah. And so, uh, all that takes is one click on the back end in order to hide your one star reviews. So, we don't do that. We respond to them. We refund, you know, everybody's got different tastes. We have, we have like 2,500, 3,000 reviews on our website. I think like 19 of them are one star or something like that out of that. And like, we leave those up, like they're, you know, it's to each their own. Um, and well, it so just shows that you're not hiding anything like genuine, right. it's out there. Like you said, everyone has different tastes. It's not going to be yeah. for everyone. You have a really good return refund policy. So I yeah. think it's fair to leave them up and then you're not hiding anything. People are like, well, what else are they hiding? Yeah. People, my, my, you know, as a, as a quick aside, my least favorite reviewers are the ones that give like a four star review and they're like, these are amazing. They're the best sheets I've ever had. The packaging was incredible. They're cooling at night like absolutely love them four stars and i'm like what <laughs> like did you like did, like did you know there's a fifth star that you can like that you can click 
<laughs> that you can check or like people that people that leave three star reviews where they're just like they're like yeah they're good and i'm like i don't i don't feel like in the context of 2020 that's not what three stars means anymore <laughs> but yeah like um you know so yeah in any case uh we, we read every review that comes in it's, it's on our slack channel we have a slack channel for reviews that automatically plugs into our site cool. and so i read i've read every single one of our 3,000, 4,000 reviews that we've gotten so far for the company. That's so and important the f yeah. that you prioritize that. Oh my God. It's like my favorite. It's like my favorite and least favorite thing because right. every time we get a bad review, it hurts me in my soul. And I want to find that person and shake them and ask them what's wrong with them um, or apologize. And then, <laughs> the, and then every time we get a good review, it like makes my day, especially when they roll in. And like, it's just like such a fun and, and but most importantly, it tells me what people are thinking. It tells me what they're what they're concerned about what they wish they leave a lot of feedback in terms of like future product lines suggestions. And so I, I think that's the number one source of inspiration at the company is our is our reviews. I love it. And I think I think a lot of companies, if they don't already treat it like that, they should. Right. So you mentioned being in those, you know, big names, BuzzFeed, Forbes, et cetera. How were those moments like, like when you read about your company in, in, you know, magazine CC growing up, never oh, actually it was the being coolest. It was the coolest. It's the coolest. It's like the most surreal thing when you, I think a part, I think real simple was our first big review. Real simple did one in like June, 2018, which is like when we were still on, on Indiegogo. Right. Mm -hmm. And they like went out on a limb and they like reviewed our sheets. They wrote a great write up. There was no like fees or affiliate promotion or anything. It was just like a great review. And I was just like, I was so enthralled that they would do that for us. And, and so that was a really cool, surreal moment. I think the most surreal moment for me was recently, um, so, so Sheets and Giggles, we've donated uh, $40,000 to Colorado COVID-19 emergency relief, um, which is me very meaningful for a company our size. Like that's, I think that's Comcast, Comcast donated like 100,000. We don't, <laughs> and they've got like a $200 billion market capitalization. Um, and we, you know, we donated 40 grand and like, and you know, the Amazon caught wind of it somehow i can't remember how they caught wind of it i think it's because like their their pr team like reached out to us and they were like do you have anything interesting for us to potentially cover amazon's good like that their pr team will like proactively reach out about stuff like that and i was like well you know we're doing this donation piece where we're donating 20 percent of our sales for 30 days to COVID 19 and they and they looked into that they also by interviewing me they found out that we had donated uh about 228 sheet sets I always, I always do that with numbers. I'm like about 228 <laughs> uh, sheet sets to uh, Denver area homeless shelters because Denver realized they were going to have a huge influx of symptomatic homeless individuals. And when you, when that happens, if they're in the general population, it's going to spread throughout the general population of the shelter. And then it's going to spread throughout the population of the city. And, and so basically they had to build these, what they're calling respite motels, really genius move by Denver. Um, to build these like little 10 by 10 motels where they have a cot, a sink, like linens, towels, like it's like a, it's like a motel, it's like a nice stay and they can stay there for as long as they're symptomatic. And then that way they can be isolated from the general population and taken care of as a homeless individual. And so they, they kept asking around in Denver, they said, who, who does bed sheets in Denver? They kept hearing our name. And so, you know, the downtown Denver partnership called me and they said, we need, you know, we need someone to donate some sheet sets. And we gave them uh, almost like, is it, I think it was all we had on hand at the time for Twin and Twin XL, 228, tens of thousands of dollars in retail value. And then uh, Amazon also uh, found out that we were donating our sheets, fabric to mask makers across the country. And they, and they wrote this piece about us that named S&G as one of six small businesses making an impact during the pandemic. And I was like, so floored by seeing my company as like the number two company listed in that article of like six companies making a difference during the, the pandemic. And that was, that was really special to me because, you know, you, you, a lot of times you like, you wonder if you're on the right path and, you know, you wonder if like your, your hard work is like worth it. And, and if, you know, you gotta, you gotta go to therapy and like talk to people and like, um, I, I went through a personal breakup in 
the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, it was partially because uh, my, uh, my ex said that, um, and, you know, no, there's no hard feelings at this stage, but like, you know, basically that uh, I put too much value on my company um, and on my work. And, um, you know, to see that, you know, a couple months later, um, and to be able to like contribute meaningfully to, to our state was like very, it was very meaningful for me, uh, in that moment. So yeah, it's super surreal, super surreal. Yeah. That's like a, a switch. Like I felt like that was, I don't know. That's just an incredible moment to see your company listed with the other companies. Some of them are big companies. Top like, three. Like, like, holy. Yeah, no, I believe yeah, you. Yeah, it's cool. I believe you. Yeah, it was my, my, I was saying like my weird little betting company, you know, like it's like, uh, it's just this thing that I, I had an idea for three years ago. And now like, you know, I, I get to donate money to my community and like we get to, we get to donate to homeless shelters and we get to help people like in very like, you know, specific like actionable ways. And it's just, I don't know, it's really like we, we donated this year, we donated, um, for last year's sales, we, we like pool everything in, in one year and then the next year we donate. We donated twenty thousand trees uh, for last year's sales. We we wow. do a tree, a tree for every a tree for every customer, and um, yeah, and it was like it was just really cool to to be able to like write that check and you know the trees get planted in Colorado and California and and uh, the Pacific Northwest and South Florida and like all areas that I love. I lived in Seattle. I love California. Colorado is where I live now. South Florida is where I'm from. And so we're planting all these trees, and it's like it's just really cool for me to to help reforest uh, areas that need reforestation as well. Yeah, I can imagine the feeling of growing a baby like from scratch, and then also being able to do it with like sustainability and yeah, all these amazing like other things. Donating, like I mean, like seriously, I wake up in the morning, I'm like, I just donated fucking you know x thousand dollars to save koalas. Like it's not, it's just like it's the cool. You know, we donated during the the protest in June, and we're gonna. We're actually working on a few different things, uh, ideas to like continue on with helping with uh, uh, ending police brutality and militarization, two causes that are very, very near and dear to me um, ever since the first time I was handcuffed, uh, <laughs> which is probably worth for another podcast. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, we donated thousands of dollars to, to uh, that, that cause as well. And uh, we don't publicize everything, like some stuff we do kind of flies into the radar because like we just you know it's like kind of just it's more of like a team galvanizing thing you know what i mean right right yeah I feel like internally being in 2020 just to like backpedal a bit because you said the koalas so many vegans literally vegans everywhere so i feel like especially them being able to like go somewhere to buy these sheets no our, our sheets are certified vegan yeah they're, yeah, they're like they're PETA certified vegan yeah it's amazing it's amazing yeah. um so how did you come up with your price point for the sheets? Did you base it on a percentage increase to create a healthy margin or mm. was it based on your competition's price? That's a great question. It's a great question. Um, I'll be completely honest. The sheets are priced at an, at an area where we think we can build a successful company. And that's sort of period bottom line. Like if, if I think that we can have higher velocity, so like, so there's a trade, there's a, there's a lot of pricing theory built into how we price our sheets. And there's a lot of pricing theory built into how you should price anything. Um, and I can go into a few of the, my favorite pieces of it, but um, you know, for example, pick arbitrary numbers. Our sheets are not $150. They're $147 and 90 cents. Why? Because who would arbitrarily pick that number? Um, it has to mean something. And so the consumer will see that and psychologically think that that number is more fair. Additionally, it removes the opportunity cost from the purchase, because if I tell you that something is $100, you can think of 20 other things that you can spend $100 on, and you have an opportunity cost associated with that purchase. That's true. But, if, but if it's priced at $107 or $113.84, I don't know anything else that costs one hundred and thirteen dollars and eighty four cents, and so it kind of it kind of like removes the opportunity cost from the purchase, and it makes it one less barrier to conversion. And so there's a lot of pricing theory that that kind of is built into why our prices are exactly the way they are. But the bottom line is that when it net net nets out, we're able to make a healthy enough margin to where once we I think I think once we broke, I can't really say this on a podcast because like it's kind of competitive intel. 
But like once we got past a certain number in sales per month, I knew that we were going to be a profitable, self-sustaining company. And for a young company in year three, that's the most important thing because now we don't have to raise more venture capital. We don't have to raise more, more, more money in debt. Um, we can do that to accelerate our growth and we likely will. Um, but it's great because now you kind of control your own destiny. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're constantly relying on venture capital or debt, then, you know, you're kind of never in control of your own destiny. Um, so that's the bottom line as to why they're priced in terms of like why the prices are where they are. Our manufacturing costs are about three times what cotton is about 10 times what polyester is. So necessarily we're going to be more expensive than, you know, a lot of those other options. That being said, I work really, really, really hard to make sure, and I, we, we put you know downward pressure pressure on our manufacturers. We give them bigger and bigger purchase orders. We use that to renegotiate, and then basically we make sure that our prices. My golden rule is that we're always going to be below Brooklyn, and I, I hate picking on Brooklyn because I'm very impressed with the company they built. I think that they they you know I think they had like a hundred million dollars in revenue last year. They're like a fantastic company for us to model ourselves after, but for their basic cotton sheet set, like their number one bestseller, like 159 bucks for a queen set. Mm -hmm. And I would bet, I can't say I know for certain, but I would bet that our manufacturing costs are significantly higher than theirs, meaningfully higher than theirs. And so uh, our prices are, you know, 10 bucks lower than that. And I, and I make sure that we're always under their pricing because I know that they're kind of like the model for sheets on the internet. And I, I, my goal with that pricing is to make sure that you don't have to pay more to try a new fabric. So, you know, there are, of course, there's plenty of options out there that are going to be lower priced than, than our sheets. Um, but I do my best to both price them based on our costs, our business model, um, uh, the arbitrariness and the pricing psychology that I mentioned earlier in terms of like the final pricing and then making sure that we're always underneath who I consider to be kind of our main um, like, like symbol for bed sheets on the internet type of competitor. Right. That's a great answer. Um, Thanks. When it comes to. <laughs> I think it, I love, I love pricing. Pricing is, it's such an odd thing. It's like. It's very interesting it's, to you, know how they you know, got there at that point for sure. Most prices are just, uh, you know, finger to the wind. Like it's a mo like, and, and in terms of the industry, if I can be honest and with the audience, the industry, generally speaking, a lot of people don't know why bed sheets cost $30 here and $250 at Bowen Branch or, you know, why that is. And the, the answer is it's perceived brand value. So basically you've got, you know, probably 20% or so of the pricing is based on, um, eh, maybe, maybe more than that, but like, I would say a piece of the pricing is based on the material used. So, you know, polyester, no matter how nice polyester is, you can't charge a hundred dollars for poly. If you charge a hundred dollars for polyester sheets. You are the best marketer that I had <laughs> ever met in my there. entire life. It's, you're you're getting twenty times margin on that, right? Like, unbelievable marketing if you're doing that. Um, cotton, you know, you can charge in the hundreds of dollars for cotton, but at some point you just have a diminishing return to how good the material is. And so a lot of that pricing that you see from the industry is pretty much, I would say, seventy five percent of it is perceived brand value. So before you, you know, people go ahead and buy something, you know, online, um, this industry is very tricky to like figure out what a fair price is. And I, you know, I think that it's, uh, it's fair to compare different brands, compare reviews. And I kept saying from day one, like I knew as long as I had a four and a half star product at a fair price, I knew that we were going to be successful. Um, and the fact that it's sustainable is a, is a cherry on top for me. And uh, so, yeah. So top sellers, I'm assuming the bed sheets are one, but I've seen you guys have kind of branched out. You're doing pillowcases and comforters and other things. So we've got uh, sheet sets. Uh, we do singles as well. So fitted flat by themselves for people that don't like flat sheets or, you know, just need a flat. Um, pillowcases, duvet covers, comforters. Uh, we also have uh, throw blankets, um, which actually I have one over there, but um, I'm going to disturb my dog if I, if I get, <laughs> get up. Yeah. yeah. He's like sandwiched into me right now. Um, uh, and then we're adding in uh, this year, uh, we're doing uh, crib sheets, going to add some flannel. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. Yeah. We're also going to add um, a larger uh, throw blanket for the couch, like a big, like two person, like heavier throw blanket, which is going to be very lovely. Um, and then next year, I think we're going to be adding in 
couple new products that'll be really fun. Um, but in terms of like best sellers, it's really funny. I, we picked the top five colors from our pre our pre launch survey for our launch colors, white, gray, purple, blue, and uh, Navy. And then colors six, seven, and eight were green, off white, and I want to say tan and red with the next four. Mm -hmm. And so those are the next four we came out with and are coming out with. And I just, I just go straight up by consumer preference. At the end of the day, it's white and gray. Yeah. People love. They like the neutrals. I love white, the neutrals. So. <laughs> because I, see, I see it, the white behind you. It's like, yeah. I, me personally, I like you, like my, you see the painting behind me? Like this is the stuff that I love stuff like this. Like this is, it's like my bedroom. I've got our ocean blue on it, which we actually, we discontinued our ocean blue, which was one of our launch colors and my favorite color because people were just like, I, you know, I was making, I was making fun of these people this morning, actually. <laughs> they ordered, I was with my team and I was like, I ordered the blue and I thought it was going to be a lighter blue and it's <laughs> really blue, blue. I would like a refund. Then I'm like, oh my God, like just, it's blue. Like, like you know, like, and, it, and it's beautiful. So like. That was definitely a female who yeah, wrote that. There were, it was her, I think that particular person's name was uh, Deborah. Sorry for any Deborah's listening. <laughs> She's um, the new Karen. Could have been a Karen. Yeah, could have been a Karen. I, 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 that's, I, I don't want to get into the, you know, that, that stuff, but I, I could, trust me, I'm a, I love talking politics. Um, But so. <laughs> So basically, uh, we we have now seven colors: white and gray crush, um, and then we're coming out with four new colors this next month: uh, lavender, sage, tan, and red, uh, which I'm really really excited about the red. Uh, and I obsess over like bright bold colors. Like my two favorite colors for my bed are the mint green. I love like people were like, come out with a sage green, and we came out with a mint green. And all the people who wanted the sage were like, what oh, the no, fuck? And we so were like. Oh, we love it like we like we, we like this better but we're coming out with a sage for them as well but like the mint is so crisp it's like a it's like the perfect mint green and it looks beautiful and i've got a painting just like this over my bed that's a bigger like a more colorful it's a sunrise it's got like blue to blue to purple nice and uh like it's actually on our website in a few different places i i take a lot of pictures when i'm bored um with, with harvey and i put them on the website um, yeah i noticed that really cute yeah photos. And it's cheap too yeah, uh, for sure. Cutting costs. Me, me and Harvey are the cheapest models this company will ever get. And it's get. personable. Uh, like, it's the yeah. owner and his dog. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because, because like, a lot of companies, I, I actually have, like, imposter syndrome over this sometimes. We're, like, you know, on our homepage right now, the two girls on, a, on our homepage um, with, the, with the dog that's kissing one of their faces, that's Jimena and Andrea. And they're two of my very good friends in Denver. And I, I you know, I always use my friends and my, and my teammates' friends for photo shoots because I have a belief that you cannot recreate that like raw chemistry of friends on film. Absolutely. And so like our first photo shoot, which is like our most famous photo shoot where we had the three men in bed drinking red wine with avocado face masks on. And, you know, uh, we had uh, Virginia, my friend Virginia, uh, you know, it was me and my buddies, Tony and Dan in that picture. And then it was Virginia, who's married to Tony. We had her saw a two by four and a half in the bedroom with a circle saw, just so we could get like the joke about sawing logs, like snoring. Like we just wanted that that joke. And like, you know, we had like cigars and whiskey, and we were, we, I mean, we had so much fun. Like ten of my friends that day, we were laughing and and eating pizza and just having a blast. And that type of like raw energy translates so well to film. But I do have imposter syndrome sometimes with that because I think like maybe. Like maybe we should hire more models, you know, like maybe we should be more like, you know, professional or sterile or like whatever it is. But I think that like you just lose the personality of the brand at that point Absolutely. because models just can't, no offense to, to models and actors, but like it's, it's extremely difficult to come in and recreate that chemistry. So I think it depends in what market slash industry you're in. You know, I buy a lot of activewear. It's an addiction. And some of the biggest like companies I follow. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I buy a lot of Yori. I love, I, that's that's <laughs> my, active, my athleisure wear. Yeah. 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 So like depending on the brand, you know, they do the same thing. They're just hiring their friends that work out a lot and look yeah. good, you know? So then they'll put on the outfit and they're like, hey, like I have a shoot tomorrow. Like, are, are, do you have an hour or whatever it is? Um, but yeah, I think it makes it completely more personable. It's so much more fun that way, raw, realistic, yeah. as opposed to like, okay, like go sit in the bed and like 
act this way and it's so less smile laugh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, natural, instead, staring yeah, at them while instead taking of that photo. yeah and i can't you know i with with models like you can't like uh you can't make a joke that maybe like you and your friends would find funny and bust up the room and get like a great laugh on camera like because you know maybe maybe it's insensitive at some level or something like that or it's just like maybe not like the most workplace friendly thing like so like I love I love making sure that like we always keep it real and like we we have a lot of fun and um I just love that like and my friends are all famous now like I love like my like my my friend uh Amro uh who's in bed with Harvey in the blue sheets on our website Amro I just had I, I had a picnic with him the other day he's one of my quarantine circle buddies um you know he's like the nicest sweetest dude uh he's arabic so i, I call him uh my habibi and I'm, a, I'm actually half lebanese so he calls oh. me habibi as well and uh and so he was on the home page of amazon the other day and like i sent him a screenshot i was like look man i was like you're on the home page of amazon he and he was just like this is so surreal um and i lo- i just love that because like and he, he and harvey are friends so like they're playing in the bed and harvey knows him and like you know it's just it's great to I, I love that piece of the brand sounds like fun photo shoots are just like a photo shoots are blast hang out time and oh my god content out of it <laughs> yeah you get you you drink eat laugh take pictures with your friends play with dogs um what better do, yeah. like what more could you get <laughs> yeah yeah and for those those who in the audience who want to know more about my dog harvey uh, who's the jack russell that's sleeping very peacefully behind me um he has his own web page it's sheetsgiggles.com slash and uh he is our vp of marketing is what we call him so, oh cute yeah, yeah. so That's super cute. Uh, yeah, he's, now he's, his head uh, popped out. Yeah. He's, always, he's he's always sleeping yeah he's a perfect model for the company he's always sleeping <laughs> so um i read that you know the any refunds get donated i think mm-hmm. that's a great idea because you're eliminating that waste it's going towards you know someone else who needs it um so what made you come up with that that model and then the hashtag thing give two sheets i think it's all great i think it's great. <laughs> well i so like the the give two sheets is just kind of a cheeky way to like say like the donation model like i really wanted to do give a sheet but that was already trademarked by somebody so Darn. <laughs> yeah so give two sheets um and then uh look at how pe- he's the best he's like he's the, so peaceful i know he's you don't find jack russell's that are like this often no <laughs> um but yeah, so uh, basically, I knew from day one that we were going to do a lot of donations. Like, I figured, why am I going to start a company if I'm not going to have fun with it, um, and you know, and help people? Like, what's the point of of doing anything? And so I, uh, I basically from day one just like um, had the idea that we were going to donate all returns, that we were going to do ten uh, percent off if you had donated your old sheet sets, and also sheets are the number two most requested item at homeless shelters uh, behind socks. Wow. And so, yeah, so it's actually really crucial that people donate their sheets instead of throw them away. As long as they're in good condition, don't, you know. But, like, you know, it, we, we get a lot of people that email us, you know, and then we give them 10% off. They just send us a selfie of them at the uh, homeless shelter dropping off the sheets, and we give them a 10% off code. That's awesome. I love that. Um, do you ever see yourself working with, like, hotels and having your sheets be put up in those rooms? Or yeah, I like think that? I'd like to. Um yeah, I think I'd like to. Uh, I think that uh, the trick with this material is that it's because it's so delicate, you can't wash it on like high heat over and over again. Mm. And if you're talking about a hotel, you're talking about literally high heat every single day and also True. drying on high heat. True. And so our wash instructions are cold, delicate, slow, or no heat dry. And they'll last you for years if you do it that way. But if you do it the way the hotels do it, I mean, you know, they might get six months of use out of them. And so it's not a very economical decision for the hotels right now. We are looking into different ways to make them last longer with that type of intensity. Um, we might have to do some type of blend uh, where we do like a 50-50 recycled polyester. So like poly from discarded plastic bottles um, and then like 50% of the eucalyptus lyocell and see if that works out. But um, That's a good idea. Yeah, we could do something like that, but it's still the Lyle cell is so delicate. I just don't know if it can hold up to that type of abuse. So how has the pandemic affected your company and what does the future look like for it? <laughs> Initially, it was horrific. Then it became great. And then it became bad again. And so it's just kind of all over the place. 
And so to take you through a couple things there, like I think the two week, the two or three week period in mid to early March was so, so disastrously brutal for everyone, everyone, but also, you know, for the company and for, for my mental health, like, you know, I was, I was a wartime CEO, right? Like, you know, peacetime CEO knows that you always need a plan. Wartime CEO knows that sometimes you got to roll a hard six. And so I was up working, you know, 5 a.m. every night, making sure that we had enough financing, inventory, different things to get, you know, to get through this. Like India was going on lockdown. March 24th was when the, was when the country shut down. So our, you know, our supply chain, we ceased production, um, you know, I think a couple of weeks before that and made sure everybody was safe, made sure that our team was off um, a little bit, luckily. So back in January, which is kind of funny because it seems like uh, a lot of other people didn't see it coming that were, you know, in a position to do something about it. Um, and back in January, I, uh, I got a bunch of units uh, stateside because I just knew, I knew that if China was shutting down its ports then it was very serious. And so to make sure that we, we did our due diligence and, and got enough inventory over here to last us a few months. Wait, so you did that in January? Yeah, I did it in January, yeah. How did mm -hmm. you know that? Because China shut down its ports in December. I, I think, I think the, day, the, day, the day after Christmas, the day after Christmas, I texted, I texted my director of product and I, I said, hey man, I hope you had a good Christmas. Um, Mike's the best. He's, uh, he's like my father at the company. Um, 40 years textile supply chain manufacturing experience. I couldn't do anything without Mike. And um, I texted him. I said, hey man, uh, I, uh, I'm really worried about this coronavirus thing. Um, and I said, uh, I don't know. Uh, and I said, you know, let, let, you know, if China's shutting down their ports, then this is going to be a really serious thing. If China, China shutting down their ports is like basically shutting down their whole economy or like a big piece uh -huh. of their economy. Uh -huh. And so that was just knew how serious it was just from that single indicator. And so, you know, Mike, Mike, uh, he's a little fashion of guy. And he was like, he was like, yeah, you know, Colin, I think that's a China thing. And I said, no, I said, no, it's, this it's is a bigger. I, I said, it's a virus. I was like, it's not, it's not, China. I said, it's a virus. I said, let's go ahead and, you know, preemptively get, you know, I think it was something like, like another 13,000 units that I asked to get on a boat. And um, we moved really quickly on that. And that was a really good decision. Um, and I just remember the freneticism of late March being on the phone at, you know, one in the morning with my guys in India trying to get, you know, more inventory out the door and, and, you know, uh, it, man, it was like pandemonium. Um, and uh, we had a 75 day production stoppage, our sales and the last two weeks of March and the first week of April, our sales dipped 30%. We had a total supply chain shutdown production pause. We had major international and local logistics um, and freight um, major, major challenges. You know, I, I had a friend whose father passed away from it. Um, we had investors basically call us and tell it like, are you guys going to be okay? Yeah, we're going to be okay. Great. Because nobody's going to be investing any money this year. Like, you know, make sure that you've got a lot of dry powder. Like, right. you know, we, we had, you know, we had a, I think I had expected to get about a half million dollar uh, line of credit approved uh, the last week of March. And they called me that company and basically said, Hey, we're, we're going to be pulling this. And, um, and I was like, why? And they said, just because of the, you know, the current atmosphere, it's so uncertain that we don't know what we're, what we're doing. So it was like chaos. And then going into April as well. And then the first week of April, uh, like I said, uh, I went through a breakup, um, you know, girlfriend left because she uh, couldn't deal with the, with, you know, the stress that I was putting on myself at that point in time. And, uh, which is fair. And then, um, you know, I basically, um, like April was like a really difficult month. <laughs> and then, uh, May, we really came out of it. May, we came out of it really good. We had mother's day. People were a little calmer. It was a little less crazy. We had, you know, we had gotten, um, a little bit of our inventory situation sorted out. Amazon had gotten a little bit sorted out. Um, and it seemed like things were going in the right direction. And then June, we actually ran out of inventory on pretty much everything. That was when the, you know, the March, April, May production stoppage really, really hurt us. We, we were out of queen white, king white, king gray, queen gray, all duvet covers, all pillowcases. We were out of everything almost. And so wow. month in June um, and now July, we're rebounding a little bit. 
Um, and then August, I think will be a really good rebound month. So it's just been, you know, the, the thing is, the longer this goes on with the more uncertainty, um, you know, the, the, the more, the greater the risk to everybody's business becomes. Um, I'm feel, feel very, very lucky and very privileged that I don't have a company that's very highly leveraged in physical retail. I might part bleeds for, you know, everybody in Denver who's lost their jobs and, and across the country. Um, and it, you know, it's one of the reasons why the team and I moved very quickly to donate meaningful money to the relief efforts in the state. Um, and so, yeah, it's just been a wild time. It's thing is, I think it's been like mostly emotionally difficult for me to like keep the off field stuff from affecting the on field stuff. And right. um, I feel very lucky and, and privileged to work with the people that I work with because they, they were able to really pick me up, um, you know, in a bad spot uh, in the beginning of this when I was so stressed out. Right. So what's the future of the brand look like? Do you feel like you're getting more on track now? Are you just kind of... Oh, yeah, the brand, brand's going to be great. The brand Right now, we're in a really good spot. We did more. So we ended up doing... Um, until we ran out of inventory, we actually ended up every month this year had been larger than the corresponding quarter last year. So we, we actually are on a great growth trajectory. We are, um, you know, at a point where... Um, you know, I feel like 2021 is going to be just a gangbusters year. And, and I'm really hopeful that, you know, um, the external situation gets under control, but in terms of the internal situation of the company, we're in a really good place. We got 3000 reviews, 4,000 reviews from customers who love us and trust us. We love them. Um, great new product lines coming out. I think the interesting thing about the future of the brand is actually going to be more in the evolution of the brand voice itself. So that I've always struggled with because I'm like a funny first dude. Um, and I really I, you know, my, like a Seinfeld, like my, my sense of humor and the brand, you can kind of like think about it as like a mix of like Seinfeld, SpongeBob, um, Dan Levitard show on ESPN. Uh, maybe a couple other, a couple of the parks and rack and that sort of thing. Like the, uh, the non sequiturs, the fourth wall breaking, the parentheticals. Like I, I, you know, I love really good, smart humor. And um, I think that the problem with it is that while it's really amazing for like building like a really viscerally like passionate customer base, it's also like, I think probably hindered us in terms of like mass market um, growth. I, that's just something that I maybe internalized from investors who like, who are in my ear about this a little bit. Um, I haven't seen too many negative effects from it, but what I like about this, um, opportunity in time is that we're actually taking the moment to shift from a funny first, sustainable and positive second mm -hmm. to positivity and social good first, mm -hmm. and then funny second. Um, and so we're kind of, we're not, we're not changing the overall recipe. It's just more removing one in front of the other as like the core brand voice. And I think that that's actually going to be really powerful. And we've done a really good job of like organically giving ourselves the opportunity to do that with, with what we've done and uh, from a charitable perspective. For sure. So are your manufacturers open again then? We're, we're, we're now producing again. Yes. Correct. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So yeah. what does a day in your life look like right now? Or maybe before <laughs> pandemic, what as the CEO founder? Uh, well, so I'm 30. So uh, I'm not dead, but I am uh, now um, an old man. And so uh, my life before the pandemic um, was, you know, well, I was, I mean, I was in a relationship at the time. So like, it was slightly different than, you know, like single twenties life, but like, you know, it was a lot of travel home to Florida, see my family. I got a little niece and nephew, love seeing them, three-year-old, one-year-old, got my, my sister down there, my mom, my dad whole family. So I would go to Florida probably once a month um, to see them. Uh, I, you know, would travel a lot. Last year, I went to nine weddings. Um, uh, yeah, turn 29. Yeah. And you'll get, you'll get invited. If you're an extrovert at 29, you go into a lot of weddings. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so I went to nine weddings last year. I there was a four week period last year in April and May, where I went to Scotland, London, Amsterdam, Scotland, uh, back to Denver, Bogota, Colombia, back to Denver, all in about three or four weeks. 
and Holy. yeah, that was nuts. Um, but yeah, I went to, I, I, I travel internationally every year. I love doing that, like for both work and, and fun. Like on, when I go to India, I stop at like Dubai on the way back and, and that sort of thing. And like, um, I, uh, I love my life. Like, it's just very, like, I would say like right now during the pandemic, it's shifted a lot more towards like healthy habits. So like, um, the last three months, um, I've been cooking like a ton more. I love cooking. Uh, I'm doing meal prep every Sunday now. So like, that's kind of how I spend my Sundays. Saturdays are for the pool or for camping. I'm in Colorado. So I love going out with my friends. We get, I get my tent from REI and my gear and me and Harvey will go out um with my buddies and we'll we'll do like a little getaway in nature every month or so um and uh you know i uh i think i i've been working out like six out of seven days during the pandemic uh so i've lost 20 pounds that's awesome in the last three months yeah so i feel really um but uh Where did you yeah, work out? did you have equipment i just I, in march I, the best thing i ever did is i bought i bought a set of free weights for the apartment the the bow flex ones that like adjust yeah. um from like five to fifty, and I just you know six o'clock rolls around. I I set a personal goal. I used to work all the time. I set a personal goal: no more work after six p.m. So I'm done um, with Your work at six p.m. now every day. So I would just lift weights for an hour and then make dinner. And I've shifted all my food to like healthy food. So like instead of pasta, I'm doing chickpea pasta. Unbelievable. Shout out to my buddy, Brian Rudolph, who is the CEO of Bonza Pasta. It's a chickpea pasta. Um, he's one of my good friends from Emory in 2012 uh, for my class. And uh, like, you know, instead, like a lot of people when they do, this is just a total aside, they do meal prep. I think it's always like chicken breast, rice, and like vegetables. It's just like the most boring thing in the world. I love to do like a chickpea pasta with like grilled shrimp and shallots and like a nice mushroom, like olive oil reduction, like, and it's just like super healthy and delicious. That um, sounds like my mouth's watering. <laughs> yeah, super, super bomb. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's day in the life right now is like pretty typical, um, you know, 30 year old dude who also runs a company. Um, I just wish that it wasn't like, I wish I like, I really, I miss yoga. I used to go to yoga every day. Um, yoga? Yeah. I, could, I used to do core power um i used to do like c2s and stuff in sculpt class and stuff and i really i really miss core power um i miss like i miss being able to go out with my buddies and get a beer like i'm a big time extrovert um but i think that like this time time has been really good to just like learn how to be more comfortable being alone and like um i think that's been helpful for me uh and uh it's just been like uh i just miss i miss like the normal stuff like i, 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 used, to, I, used, to, I used to love going to the movies i'm like a big huge marvel cinematic universe nerd i was so looking forward to black widow this summer and eternals in november and you know like now like there's no such thing as movies anymore <laughs> i know and i used to go to alamo draft house and see like a movie like every month and i, I miss that a lot so do you guys have drive-ins there we do but like you know they're showing all old movies which is fun and, true, and true. good but like you know you just watch just watch jurassic park on my for sure. Yeah, my boyfriend recently got me into all of the Marvel movies, which I nice. never watch. Before. I, yeah, I don't. I don't think I watch any of them. Spider Man. <laughs> yeah, then maybe that was the only one growing up, and that one was cool. And then yeah. he introduced me to like the whole DC world too, and I was like, oh my god, there's like two worlds, two, like, two different universes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Insane. Yeah, and yeah. Like, this I'm, is, I'm like, a this character in this world. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it's really good. I'm so glad I got on that bandwagon. A little bit yeah. too late, but. <laughs> No, it was great. I, I saw, so I think the coolest thing about those movies that I, I love the most is like how they're like, they bring people together from across the world. So um, I was in Edinburgh. Uh, no, I was in St. Andrews when Avengers Endgame came out. And I saw Avengers Endgame on this like tiny little movie, movie theater screen um, in St. Andrews with a bunch of Scots. And, you know, St. Andrews is a college town. So it was a bunch of kids that were probably like 19, 20 years old in the audience and i'm like sitting there with my dad and you know we were traveling together playing golf and you know i'm i'm in this movie theater and you know the people from across the across the ocean that i you know i've never i have nothing in common with them growing up or anything like that you know are hooting and hollering and throwing popcorn and like and screaming it was just such a great experience and like and then i saw it again in london uh and then you know i saw it in denver i saw it in south florida and so, like, I'm a, like I said, I'm a huge, huge Marvel nerd. Like, I was, I was so excited for Endgame, and uh, and so, yeah, it's been, it's been really great to like grow up with that. Like, my 20s was basically like that Marvel. That was like my the Star Wars of my 20s. Like, so, um, yeah. Interesting question. A day in the life. I, I feel like, 
Oh, you know, something cool I did that I'd encourage every business owner out there listening to do is, is um, I, I told my team, I'm going to pay them 500 if they set a personal goal and achieve it. And then that, and, yeah, 500, yeah, 500 bucks if they set a personal goal and achieve it. So not a business goal, but like read a book every week or, you know, for me back in Q2, it was like do a hundred squats before I check my email. Um, and like no work past six. That was my personal goal. Another one of my personal goals. And then, you know, one of my team members, Carl, he wanted to take singing lessons. So like his was get a singing lesson every week. And now it's more from the monthly goals for a hundred bucks and quarterly goals for 200 bucks, so like 500 total for the quarter. And it's been such an awesome galvanizing thing for the team. So now I'm reading a book a month. Um, and my team, I wish I could do a book a week. I just don't have enough time for it. And then my team is, uh, they've got all their cool goals, like, you know, drink at least a gallon of water a day, like, you know, do cardio four times a week, like, um, you know, go see, go see my family at least once a week. Like there's like a bunch of cool things that everybody's kind of set for their personal goals. That's awesome. What's yeah. your favorite Marvel character? Captain America. Really? Uh, yeah. I love Captain America. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen Endgame yet? I have. I have. I've seen them okay. all now. So major spoilers for anybody listening. If you have not seen Avengers Endgame. Don't watch this part. Don't, don't watch this part. Don't watch this part. <laughs> Fast forward two minutes. But the part where, and I've tried to say it without too many spoilers, the part with Cap and the hammer at the end of the movie, like that when the audience like just lost their freaking minds when that, like that was like the best movie experience I've ever had in my entire life. I was like, I was like whistling. I was like, I was a baseball game. I was like, I was, I was like a, at a sporting event. And um, so, yeah, I love, I love Cap. I just love, I love having a moral compass in the movies that you can kind of like use as like your North Star. Right. Um, and then I just love, I love the character development they did with the character. I love anything that's well written. Like I'm a big, with me, like words, like whether it's of affirmation um, or, you know, like just the copy that I write for a consumer brand or, you know, going on stage and pitching in front of an audience, words are like, and, and well, well written, um, you know, anything that's well written is like such a, a drug to me. Like when I was little, it was like, you know, the original Dragon Ball Z series or, you know, the DC animated universe with like, you know, tying in Batman, the animated series with Batman beyond 10 years later, like right. those tie-ins, like that type of stuff is so hard to pull off. And so then when you have like a guy like Captain America, who like starts out as this like, you know, war, war hero, soldier, like lit follows orders, so on and so forth. And they bring him through this like, you know, path where he has his, his like everything questioned and like he breaks down his belief system. And then it kind of like comes full circle. And, and he's like this completely different character at the end of the series and is able to like indulge in what he wants for himself. And then on the opposite side, you have Tony Stark, who, you know, begins his journey. We we're just talking about Marvel at this point. He begins his journey as like, you know, obviously like the selfish playboy billionaire philanthropist. And then through his arc and through his, the things that happen to him, he becomes the selfless guy who doesn't sacrifice play. And I, I just think that that's such a cool, and then they, and they, of course, they meet in the middle in Captain America's Civil War, where they, where they come to odds while they're both going from A to their B, they hit right in the middle of their character arcs. And like, I just, I love stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I can talk about Marvel more than I can talk about the business. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I saw it in theaters because my boyfriend said the same thing you said. He was like, at this part, like the whole like freaking theater went insane. Like at this yeah. part, I saw people crying. I was like, man, like I wish I was in the theater. Like because him and his friends, it's like a thing that they go and see. Like his core group of friends that go see every, you know, movie. Like the that's night great, comes that's out. Great that, or... you watched it, that you watched it through with him though, because I bet he got to live vicariously through your experience. Like, yeah. Seeing a yeah, exactly. And I'll bet he, I'll bet it was really special for him. Yeah, like he was like, I honestly don't know if I'd ever watch these all again just because, like, yeah. I already know what happens. Like, I've I've been like I grew up in my childhood like watching these now. Right. But he's like seeing now you go through it. It's like so crazy. So it's it's yeah, I bet it was really like I bet it was really special for him. So that's cool you did that with him. Yeah, no, it was fun. Definitely a nice quarantine thing that we yeah. we took on. Um, advice you would give a young entrepreneur in maybe the shoes you were once in. Maybe they're discouraged. People are telling them like that's not gonna happen, or like you're dreaming too big. What would you say? Um. Well, I mean, there is such a thing as dreaming too big, <laughs> <laughs> in this, in this, uh, like in the sense not to be a Debbie Downer, in the sense of like 
a lot of people think they're going to like start a company, build a billion dollar business and like be super rich and successful and famous and shit like that. And that leads people into doing the entrepreneur lifestyle where they're constantly posting pictures of like, you know, fucking themselves with their car and like an inspirational quote or some bullshit like that on Instagram. Like the reality is if you're an entrepreneur and you're a founder, you're grinding way too fucking hard in your first year or two of business. I, I used to work 16 hour days every day. I used to, you know, I used to work on the weekends. I still do a lot of the time. You know, I would be up till four or five in the morning working every night. I didn't have fucking time to post on Instagram. Like, and, it, and like, and so I think that like the thing that, that maybe worries me or bothers me is like people having like way too, like these huge audacious type of plans. And there's nothing wrong with having a, like a big audacious plan. Um, if you have the um, background experience, connections, financial resources and know how to, to go do that. And so right now what I see S and G as for me is my first business, the first time I'm a CEO, first time I'm a founder, I specifically chose a, a betting company, a bed sheets company, because I felt the business model was specific to succeed at. And so you have to ask yourself, what's the thing in the world that I'm best at? Maybe you're best in the world of social media management. Maybe you're best in the world at, you know, digital marketing. Maybe you're the best in the world at copywriting or at, you know, video editing and figure out how that core strength can be applied to the business that you want to start. And it's okay to have a good modest goal. The problem with the current startup community and with the venture capital community is that there are a million outcomes in between bankruptcy and a $100 million plus exit that are completely life-changing. You, you can exit a company for $10 million, $5 million, $20 million, and change the entire trajectory of your life. You can start a company making $10 million a year, $5 million a year, and, and, and maybe it never grows beyond that. But that, even that can be completely life-changing in terms of building a business that allows you to have complete flexibility and independence and financial independence. Um, and the ability to never have to like listen to a manager's bullshit again. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> just one of my pet peeves. And so like, if you are starting may, I would say like of a few things, make sure that you're, you're picking something that you feel your best in the world at, make sure that you are being realistic in your goals and that you aren't thinking that the first time you start a company, it's going to be this fucking Facebook home run. Um, and then also when you're starting a company, make sure that you validate it and that it actually has market demand and traction um, before it ha before you spend a ton of money on inventory and before you spend a ton of money on uh, you know going to market with something that you haven't tested and, and proved out has market validation and product market fit. Absolutely. Um, and the way that we did that was with the the crowdfunding campaign was to validate that. Um, and so those are some of my my favorite things to advise. Um, and. I think that another really important piece, especially for young entrepreneurs, which I consider myself a very young entrepreneur, uh, I, you know, I started the company when I was 27, right? And when I was 25, that was my first real startup experience, going through tech stars, pulling 42 hour days, not sleeping, like, you know, I think the two final things I'd say is like, one is, I'm trying to think of what order I want to deliver these in. Uh, probably end, end on more of a, a positive note. So one is don't make your company your life. Don't make it your personality. Don't make it everything that you have to offer the world. You heard me talk today for 10 minutes on the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I could talk all day about Marvel. I could talk about like yoga, golf, like international travel. Like, I, like I'm, I'm trying to live my life the way that I want to live my life. And it's not all about sheets and giggles. And by extension of that, don't make every single goddamn post that you make on social media about your fucking company. Like people, like you will exhaust your friends and family. Absolutely. They will hate you if you continually post every single thing about like, I, like I, I maybe one out of every 10 things I post is about my company because something happened. The Amazon thing that I mentioned with the recognition for being one of six small businesses helping, or, you know, maybe like, a really awesome photo shoot that had like a really great picture that I wanted to share in the moment. Like there's things that will compel me to share. But other than that, like 
you know, you, you are more than your company. And I say that this first piece of advice for a very specific reason, because if your company fails, you do not want to feel like you have failed, like your persona, your being, your person has failed. And I see that with so many of my friends who start companies and the company goes under and they feel like fail core thing that they had in their life, which your company will always be your core thing that you have in your life, but you will exacerbate that feeling of failure if it's all your, if it's your entire personality. And so that's number one is like, if your company fails, you did not fail, the corporate entity failed and that's okay. Like those things fail all the time. And then point number two I would make is, and this is the last thing I'll say is like, and I kind of alluded to it earlier. Um, don't forget to celebrate the wins and don't forget to be proud of, of what you've done. Because I think uh, especially, um, you know, going through my recent like relationship drama and, you know, the things that people will say to you that like leave an imprint on your brain, um, you know, you can, you can, you can find yourself very unhappy in in the midst of a lot of success, like objective success. And, um, you know, if you told me, you know, 24 months ago when I was flying to India to check in on the first units being produced and I was, you know, we had very little money in the bank and I had put all my life savings behind this. And, you know, we were, I think, I think like September, 2018, we did like $20,000 in sales. Um, you know, if you had told me two years ago that my company would be turning over, you know, millions of dollars, you know, in a quarter, um, I like, I would have been thrilled. I would have, I would have absolutely like said, Oh my gosh, like, I wonder what future Colin's doing. He must be traveling the world or like, <laughs> you know, seeing his family all the time or working remotely or like whatever it is. And the truth is that like, until the pandemic hit, I was getting in my car every morning, commuting to the office, just like I would at a normal job. I was, you know, work day still. I was, you know, um, constantly pushing for more and more and more and never taking time to enjoy the, the you know, success and, and the outcomes. And so I think that now my golden rule is like, ask yourself what your last goal that you set was. Did you hit it? And if you hit it, celebrate it. Um, and, and, and give yourself that, you know, that pat on the back of like, you know, good fucking job, man. Like you, like, you know, that's you, like you exceeded your expectations and take time to be happy. And then also, you know, make sure that you, do, the number one thing is like, make sure that you always remember that work is a means to an end and, and not an end in and of itself. Such wise words. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so, I hope it was not a ramble. I don't know. No, I never... no, no, not at all. Um, I guess it kind of ties in with the last question then. So are you happy with the life that you're currently, like the path you've taken, the direction you're going in? I ask this <laughs> at the end of every single episode. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't trade this um, for almost anything. You know, I think, I think uh, in terms of like, I, there's parts of it that are tough. Like it's, it can be like, it can be lonely, like, especially as a solo founder without co-founders, like it can be, you know, you get in your own head a lot. You debate with yourself a lot, you, you know, um, but in terms of like the alternative, yeah. Like I've worked, I've worked nine to five. I've gotten in at six forty five in the morning to an office only to be screamed at. I've, you know, stayed at 9 PM only to ask why I didn't stay till 10. You know, I've, I've, um, gotten feedback from a manager that I needed to get in earlier uh, because I, I would, you know, stay till midnight and then be exhausted and get in at nine thirty. And my team was like, Colin gets in later than all of us. And that's not fair. And they'd be leaving at five o'clock. And um, the emotional stuff I've, I've lost my healthcare, like randomly, right? Like you're in America, your healthcare is tied to how good you are at fucking selling bed sheets. Um, or how good you are at, you know, doing some arbitrary thing for some arbitrary company at an arbitrary time in an arbitrary place. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, I think that like, when I, when I look back and, and I, the goal, the goal of this company, the goal of any company, I think for a lot of entrepreneurs is to like, get off the treadmill, to like get off the ride. And so that's something that I think has been a, a big win for me is like, 
I feel like I'm, if I wanted to step off, I can just get off. And um, I cannot wait. My plan for as soon as this fucking pandemic is over, I feel like it's not, I'm flippant saying that obviously, but it's not like, you know, I can feel your frustration. Don't you worry. (laughs) Yeah. um, You know, as soon as this is over, I'm going to fly to Munich. I'm going to do two weeks in Munich. I'm going to train to Vienna, three hour train ride, two weeks in Vienna, work from there. Five hour train ride to Budapest, do two weeks from there, fly back a month later, Tokyo, Osaka, Okinawa, come back. Then like, I'm just, I'm going to do the remote work life. I can work and pack Harvey up my laptop and, you know, just travel the world and work from, from different places. And like the remote life is going to allow me to do that. And my team and I decided to stay fully remote for this whole thing. And so I'm, I love the direction that my life is headed. Turning 30 has been a great, a great experience by my calculations. My 30 should be 50%, uh, even more awesome than my twenties. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm just really, I'm really happy with everything right now. And, um, definitely on the upswing. Well said, well said. So is there anything else you want to add to this episode? Mm, I don't know. I mean, your audience is a bunch of, uh, uh, Gen Z listeners and uh, millennials are way cooler than Gen Z. Uh, <laughs> so I can throw a little shade there. I think uh, actually, you know what? I like I, if your listeners are mostly Gen Z. I assume. I mean, I assume they are based on the name of the podcast. Um, I like this. This generation is really, really cool. I'm really, I'm really amped for like the people that are in their early twenties to grow in their careers and the people that are in their their late teens to you know, go to college and then enter the workforce because like I get like an overwhelming sense of like empathy, social responsibility, compassion from like that younger generation. And, you know, when I was at my first job and I was 22, they told me every single day at that hedge fund that my greatest weakness was my empathy. They told me every fucking day, like, you, like Colin, you could be such a killer if like you weren't so empathetic. Like you're like, you're way too, you care too much about other people you care too much about like how they feel and like what they think and like you know you just gotta like focus on your goals and like you know like fuck other people like and like that type of mentality is so like that's the thing that I was like like indoctrinated into when I was in my early 20s and it's such an unhealthy way of being an unhealthy way of thinking and I love that I've like turned that empathy into what I hope is a strength in terms of like starting a company that actually gives a fuck about the world and a team around me that gives a fuck about improving the world and and making people's lives better. Um, And I really hope that, you know, Gen Z by and large, it seems to me is going to be like a really empathetic generation of people. And and I'm really excited about that. Awesome. Do you want to plug your social media links? Yeah. whatever. Uh, At Sheets Giggles. uh, We're, we're fun follow. Uh, We do a lot of memes uh, and we don't like, just like post pictures of bed sheets over and over again. (laughs) Uh, so it's at sheets giggles. So the brand name, but no, and in it, uh, we're that handle everywhere, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter. Um, and then, uh, me personally, I'm at Colin D McIntosh. I do have a private Instagram. I don't, it's like mostly for my friends and family. So, um, Clarissa slid into my DMs to ask me to be on the podcast, (laughs) uh, which is fine. Uh, but yeah, LinkedIn is probably a better place to find me. Colin Sheets and Giggles, Colin McIntosh. You'll, I mean, I'm really easy to find. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your story, your obstacles, experience in life. And I can't wait for everyone to hear. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me. If you need a set of sheets, let me know. And for anyone out there listening, um, if you type in Gen Z at checkout on sheetsgiggles.com it will get you 10 percent off your order so shameless plug to end the the very uh very lovely podcast interview thank you all so much for listening and i hope you were able to take something away from colin's journey don't forget to check him and his company out sheets and giggles on all social media platforms i'll see you guys in the next episode